Okay, right, here we go. Um, so I did, uh, first of all, in my career, I started working at Dulwich Picture Gallery, um, which some of you may know um, in uh, Southeast London, which is a fantastic gallery, but also somewhere which has quite a specific collection and a specific kind of form of art. And the challenge there was to make those um, Baroque paintings relevant to um, any kind of audience. And we did some really exciting work there and I learned a huge amount from that. I then spent, as Sam said, um, 11 years working at the British Museum um, where with this extraordinary collection um, where I um, was lucky enough to work across all kinds of cultures and periods um, due to the demands of my work as an education officer um, and particularly working with young people trying to find all sorts of methods, dance, storytelling, um, interactive, digital in the later years about how objects can be brought to life and embedded within the curriculum. How do you embed museum visits in the curriculum? Um, I did my PhD in, in imperial history at that time um, uh, as part time and then have since moved into academia. Um, uh, that was, um, as uh, Sam said, my first book um, was about the history of this museum um, in the top right of your screen, which is the colonial museum created in Zanzibar um, and where I think about um, the objects and empire. And that is something which you will see running through this presentation as um, it relates to my particular expertise. But hopefully the ideas that I'm going to talk about are transferable. So um, I've just got an example there of one of the modules that I currently teach at Lincoln, where I've been teaching since 2016, Objects of Empire, the Material Worlds of British Colonialism, where we use objects as our starting point for inquiries into different periods in um, and aspects and themes in the history of empire. Um, and I'll talk a bit in the talk about why that's so, I feel that's such a good approach. Um, and then I put there the book, this is not a plug to buy, I'm putting it there just so that I can explain why I'm taking this approach. This is a book um, which was designed for university students, but hopefully all educators as a way to think about how to use material culture to study history specifically. And I wrote that with my colleague, Leonie Hannan at Queen's University in Belfast, a brilliant scholar of material culture. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that her contribution to a lot of my thinking in this um, because of that shared work that we did together. So to set out at the start, why material culture? Well, Lorraine Dastin has said, we cannot even imagine a world without things. Material culture frames our actions and experiences and is constitutive of them. So, you know, the fact that so many people rely when they study history on text actually ignores this huge amount of material that we have that can give us evidence about people's lives from the past. And we ignore that really in our peril. We're only telling half the story if we look at written accounts alone. And so in today, I'm going to really be building on the power of objects and um, why I think they're so important. And finally, about how we can embed them in inquiries. So first of all, I talk about the background to history through material culture, a little bit of some of the academic background, maybe, um, just to help you put this in context. I'm then gonna talk about object biographies and object stories, um, because I think there's just some really just examples of how rich stories of objects, biographies of objects can be um, as a way of exploring periods in history. And then finally, I'll think about putting objects at the heart of the inquiry and some of the ways in which I think you can do that, but you will have much better ideas about this than me. Um, so I really look forward to your responses to this. And as I said to Sam, I'm you know, really excited by this opportunity to speak to you. So um, I'm delighted if people get in touch with me directly by email or by Twitter, if they want to take some of these ideas and talk about them further. Um, I, I was invited here through some work I did with Harriet, which was really stimulating for me to talk to her about how to incorporate um, uh, material culture into her um, inquiry. So I'm very happy to do that with other people. Um, and I learned so much from this as well. So what is material culture? I mean, I've already seen people discussing things in the chat and absolutely those are the kinds of things we can use. Um, and um, it's a very broad bet definition. And I suppose studying material culture, we're thinking about the made and built world, but this can also include visual culture, two dimensional things, but things shaped or modified by people. And in some ways, these are two objects which I think show us the huge difference in what we can classify as material culture, both for the British Museum, lots of examples you'll see will be from there because of where I used to work, um, objects I became very familiar with. But um, at the top there, we have one of the oldest objects in the museum, um, the <clears throat> Um, a hand axe from the Aldivai Gorge, um, which shows us something which was shaped by a human to be a useful tool. So this is, a, and this is humans shaping their world to be able to create a hand axe, which absolutely fits into the palm of a hand. 
But then we also have something as complicated as this, um, the nef, the ship table ornament, um, a um, uh, Elizabethan era, um, and which is an extraordinary object. It's so complicated. It's not only a model, an ornament that would have gone in the center of a, um, uh, of a probably of a kind of dining table, but um, it also has um, a clockwork mechanism that makes, and I think it can fire guns. It is a clock as well. Um, it can play music. So it's something that does everything. But these are both things that we can use to understand our past. They've been shaped by humans. But also specimens and natural objects can be the focus of material culture studies when we see humans intervening with them. So, I mean, I work on the history of collecting. So I see collections of things, whether they're natural history or botanical specimens, the way that that collection has been shaped by people is another way of thinking about things and the way that humans have uh, uh, put together and understood their world. So this example from the Natural History Museum of how uh, these particular beetles are organized and allocated to help us understand the, the, how these um, uh, animals evolve and how they look. And so the pursuit of knowledge involved the organization of things. So in terms of the material turn in scholarship, this is something we talk about turns in scholarship, as I'm sure you know, as, as, as different waves of history become interesting. And the material turn is something where, which is, demonstrates how particularly historians um, have taken more interest in uh, uh, things and material culture in the last three decades. And I think it's important to recognize art history and archaeology have always had material culture at their heart. So, you know, the history is kind of a bit late to the, late to the party with this. Um, but and particularly modern history, I think it's very different when you're looking in the medieval and um, uh, ancient world. But in terms of those who think of themselves as straight modern historians, there's so much text out there that this has dominated scholarship. So it's taken quite a long time for modern historians to look, incorporate objects alongside texts as key primary sources. Um, but since the 1970s, we've really seen a surge in interest in material culture across the humanities and social sciences. And in history, publications really increased in the late 80s and early 1990s. And I think we see it really embedding in the late 1990s and 2000s, particularly, as I said, in relation to the modern period. And that's when we see these kinds of publications that I've um, indicated here coming out, uh, which might take the example as in the bottom left there, cotton, looking at one particular commodity and how that shaped the modern world, or looking at material culture in, uh, as in the bottom right, um, in 18th century culture and how we can use material culture to understand the work, the Georgian world in a much more nuanced way and bringing in um, a much more uh, nuanced idea of gender as well. So material things inform us about, and so many things. And I'm using this um, object, um, uh, which is a West African sculpture of Queen Victoria, which I'll talk a bit more about later, um, just illustrating it here. But this would speak to all of the themes I'm going to mention. So the production and consumption of goods, the kind of very uh, sort of economic history side of material culture, which is this is about producing, creating things, and people are buying things, uh, power relations, social bonds and networks, gender interactions, identities, cultural affiliations, belief systems, value, what mattered to people in the past. This is something we really tried to hammer home in quite a lot of the sessions we did at the British Museum, is what matters to people. Can you walk into a gallery? Let's walk into the medieval gallery and say, what matters to people? How can objects tell us what matter to people? Because I think it's really fundamental to understanding um, human experience and, and history. Um, it's a very simple question, but actually it's really uh, pertinent and things do so much work for us in understanding that ideas about value. And many, many more things. I mean, those are just a few themes which we can think about. And this object here tells us about so many of those, even just without me even giving you some context for it. And very critically, which I think is particularly pertinent to my period and that what I study, which is colonial history, is that it can give a voice to those who didn't leave a written trace. So that could be um, uh, seeking out um, African perspectives on the colonial world, as I'll discuss later. But it can also be um, trying to um, access the stories of working class people in from basically the Victorian era period um, um, or the, the non elite world, those who didn't actually record their own lives, who normally we only see them written about by other people. Um, objects can bring us closer to their own world. 
these are also still partial, they're selective um, uh, perspectives on the past, but they are a really powerful form of evidence. Um, and and uh, Lorraine Dustin, who I mentioned before, they're as, as complex, deceptive, partial, and multi-layered as text. I'm just going to think a little bit here, because I think it's quite interesting when we think about the stuff we see in museums and also how selective that is. So what survives? What are the material remains from the past? And as with documents, what remains of the past influences our ability to use it as a source. And object survival depends upon, I mean, I've broken it down to two key things. I think there's a, you can, both of these could be exploded into whole talks themselves, but um, material composition. So what is this, the object made of that really can determine what survives? So um, inorganic materials, ceramic and metals largely resist decomposition, um, but they could they can change in form so they can become, become rusted. Um, but the, and that's why they're so fantastic, particularly for archaeologists in terms of, of dating. And you know, somebody's already mentioned pottery shards, you know, they're fantastic for that. Um, but organics, wood, textiles, paper, um, unless they're preserved, are more liable to decompose. So that's when you find, for example, a leather shoe, a medieval leather shoe, which has been kind of uh, let, thrown in some mud and preserved because it's in the conditions where it doesn't decompose are so exciting because very rarely do things like that actually survive. And of course, societal values also determine what survives. So humans may choose to preserve particular items. Are they perceived as valuable? What is perceived as valuable will change over time, and it's very dependent upon, for example, collecting practices. Um, pottery shards, for example, they are discarded, but they don't decompose. So, you know, humans have tried to discard them, but the object resists and survives. So in terms of the things we see in museums, these are other questions which are interesting to think about, about what is missing from here, what is absent? Is this because it wasn't deemed valuable? Is it because it just would have decomposed? And these are interesting things to make us question our evidence source and be critical of it. But of course, we can also use text to recover the material record. Um, and I think it's what um, you know, I'm talking about the way you use material culture in the classroom. A lot of this is done without actually handling physical objects. This is by talking about them through looking at images, but also using text to understand them. Um, not all material culture historians actually handle the material themselves. So it's you can both make a material thing the source of your the subject of your inquiry, but you'll also, of course, bring in text to understand some of the questions that we have about objects. So just in terms of an example of this, um, there's an article, and I've got a bibliography at the end of the slideshow, which I'll, uh, I can share with people, but um, this is an article by Matt Holbrook about the man with the powder puff. Um, and what he uses, he wasn't going in and looking at powder puffs, so as in things were um, putting powder onto the face um, but, um, in museums, that wasn't the focus of study. He was looking at newspapers, legal documents, and memoirs. And so this is what I mean by you can bring in these kinds of sources to understand the meaning of objects. And what he focuses on there, which is so interesting, is about how men with powder puffs, um, if they were found with that on their body, cosmetics were used as a, a material sign of deviant masculinity, illicit sexuality, and de facto criminality. So the burden of proof in these court cases um, about um, men who were seen about um, gay men in the 1920s, if they were found with a powder puff on them, this would be a sign of their, uh, at that time, supposed sexual deviancy. Um, so the object there was almost a source of, you know, something that could convict them. So we see really the power of that object to, to say something about that person. Um, objects here as evidence in criminal cases. So we don't need to look very far to see quite how powerful objects can be. And I'm using that as an example of yeah, this idea that you don't have to actually be somebody who picks up an object and can understand um, the different hallmarks or the different sculpting styles or these kind of art historical questions. We can use other sources to understand the meaning of things. So why, why study material culture? Well. Um, there are rich possibilities for examining history from new perspectives and include diverse voices and peoples. And I've talked a bit about how we can do that. 
And, and, and a great example of that, and again, the, the references at the end of the, uh, the slideshow, Margot Finn's Material Turns in British History. Um, she there talks about an episode of um, a diplomatic episode in um, India in the 19th, early 19th century. But by looking at the material aspect of this um, episode, she brings in women who had been completely ignored from the previous story. She brings in Indian women as well and their role in this in understanding this diplomatic culture because things and the exchange of diplomatic gifts was critical in informing um, how some of these, uh, the, these relationships between the British and India worked. So again, she didn't use um, uh, she didn't use many kind of study, she wasn't studying the shawls themselves, she was looking at what they meant in this diplomatic world, but she completely offered a new idea about um, uh, the, this period in history, and again, bringing in those actors who hadn't been there before. I also think it engages a broad range of students, and I'm sure those of you who, I'm sure you've found this, who've, who've used material culture, is that looking at an object, whether it's on a screen um, or something handling, um, doesn't re rely on text. It doesn't rely on some of the conventional skills that some students find fan challenging. I found it a real like sort of uh, 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 leveling um, among students because some students feel really much more confident actually looking at what they think an object means because there aren't the kind of conventions or they don't feel kind of inhibited. And so I think it's really, I find it really powerful in that way. It draws on new scholarship, so this reflects what's going on in the academy. It's a new way to show that you're that, that you're we're we're building on uh, what's going on in academic scholarship. And this most important thing, I think, material things engage students and teachers. Um, I mean, I'm speaking for myself here, but the thing that got me into history was visiting historic places, seeing historic things. It was the things that made me excited about it. So I think that it really can transform and bring students to the subject. And I hope teachers as well, bring an enjoyment of history as well, using things because somehow for me, it brings me closer to those, those periods when we actually think about the things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about this subject um, because I, I think it's fascinating and I've used it in class recently and I, I, I thought it worked really well. Um, and um, then I'm going to go on and talk a bit about object biographies because of this subject. Um, so this object I um, used in a class recently, um, which and I said to them, tell me about this object, um, which was a great way just I gave them notes just tell me what you think about it and I didn't say and they speculated on its age and what I kept saying is okay and why do you think that so I got them to really do actual close study of it and they would highlight some things I didn't even notice they would say okay so I think it's it's definitely old because you can see that it's um uh I can see that it's metal because it's got a little bit rusted I think it's old and then they went and they analyzed the typography they talked about the kinds of chocolates they well we don't get those anymore I've never seen a uh, Nougat, Nougat de Montelemar. Um, and we talked a bit about that. And then we kind of speculated on its age and they used their own knowledge of kind of uh, type uh, of fonts. And they said, well, I think it probably looks a bit like the 1950s in the way that, you know, they talked about color, probably not much color was able to be used. So we had a really rich discussion just purely about looking at this thing. And I was just using a slide. This wasn't, this isn't my object that I have. But this again could be applied to any object. But then we moved on and then we discussed um, what I um, the reason I knew about this object, um, and that is because it was shared with me as part of an interviewing project where I was interviewing former members of the colonial service about the things that they had brought back from their um, period of serving in the um, in the colonies. Um, so these were people who we, in a way, we interviewed them, the last generation still living of people who actually served in the late 40s and, and 1950s um, and early 60s. And this was shown to me by someone who was a vet and he had taken this object and it was the first object he showed us. And we were expecting to see um, spears and statues and, and, and various things, but he showed us this. And um, he said, when I went out on the ship, rationing was still, um, I was going to West Africa to become a vet, a part of the veterinary service, um, and I was shown this object, uh, and I was, um, uh, rationing was still existed at home, um, but on the ship rationing didn't exist, and so I went to the ship's um, uh, tuck shop, as he described it, and I bought uh, three of these boxes, and I ate as much as I could, um, and 
so it was such and it's just added this whole other dimension that for him this object was embedded in his colonial experience his experience of travel his experience of going across the world um, of you know as a young person a formative highly formative experience um and the way um and again rationing it his experience of the war the desire for these things um so it was it has so many ways you can interpret this one thing um, because of the, the way that object has moved through time and he kept it all this time and this man was in his late 80s early 90s when I spoke to him and this was still one of those things that was that marker of that moment in time for him. So in a way, it's a deceptive object because it's uh, um, something which, you know, uh, I, I, there are so many ways to see it. And the story I told, you know, was something that could only be told by the person who kept it. So we needed that interview to bring out its meaning to him. The object biographies, and I sort of touched on that because that is the story of that object, are something which are, are, is kind of just widely used in academia now, which tells us about the way in which, um, and, and a lot of this drew out of a, a publication by Arjun Apadurai, an edited collection called The Social Life of Things, Commodities and Cultural Perspective. Um, and um, but it's also something that has been used in archaeology. And it looks at the changing meaning of objects as they move through different settings. So that the meaning of an object is not fixed. So as I talked about with the dairy box, you know, it started off with something on um, an array of things for sale, and then it adds this heightened meaning for that individual through their own experience. And following an object through its life allows you to explore its different societies and values as well as the global movement of things. But it doesn't even, I've put global because a lot of the stuff I work on is global. It doesn't have to be global. It can be very local, in fact, but you can see how an object moves, even how it's redisplayed in different places in a house or reused in different ways. Um, it talks about different values um, accord to, associated with those people. Um, put a picture of a Chinese spoon here, um, one that was found on the East African coast. Um, there had been for um, millennia the movement of things from East Asia into Eastern Africa. This particular spoon is interesting because for me it looks absolutely like something you could use in a uh, get in a Chinese restaurant now um, and uh, it looks kind of relatively familiar to us um, but where it was found in East Africa was actually um, uh, on the grave of an imam um, and it was recorded that it was actually used for burning ambergris um, as part of particular religious practices um, in eastern Africa. So again that object which purports to be a spoon used in one context or one thing and absolutely changed its meaning when it moved into the East African context and then it was collected and moved into a museum and then it takes on those other layers of meaning. So this is the idea of tracking the object biography. And I'm just going to briefly tell you an object biography from my own research um, and uh, I will, will I'm, uh, I will try and uh, not go into this in too much detail because when I start talking about my own research, I get a bit overexcited. So I'll try and make sure this is a kind of a, a, a summary. Um, but I work on the history of Zanzibar, um, as, um, uh, as was mentioned. And um, the, uh, these I'm going to talk about these particular objects. Um, so Zanzibar became a, became a protectorate of the British Empire in the 1890s, um, formally, um, uh, and that was shared with the Omani Sultanate, who they themselves had um, taken over Zanzibar, uh, the rule of the Swahili people of Zanzibar earlier in the 19th century late 18th and early 19th century. So we have these almost two layers of colonialism from Oman and then Britain. But these are objects associated with the Swahili people, so the indigenous people of Zanzibar. Um, and they're a drum and a horn, which were used in religious ceremonies um, of the Mwinyu Nku, a, a leader in Zanzibar. And um, I became very interested in these objects because they were symbols of um, kingship from the pre-colonial era. Um, they were used in times of war to rally people, but it was said also that they were hidden, that they should be kept out of sight, so that um, which was part of their sacred power was from them being kept out of sight and only used on particular occasions. And they're very beautiful. They have these um, um, beautiful inscriptions of the Quran on them. Um, this is an image of Mwinyu Nku Muhammad, whose dynasty died out in the late 18th century. And it was at that time that his collection and the objects within his palace were passed, were, were sought after by the British and were claimed by um, one of the first minister, ministers in the early 1900s. 
And he, first of all, put them on display for the first time, because normally they would have been hidden away in a secret place. He put them on display as part of his um, uh, um, Collect, uh, the display of his own collection in the First Minister's residence. So this is a kind of extraordinary image, which I've analysed in huge detail um, about trying to trace all of the objects in it. But what's so important here is that what we see is the Nguyen Khu's objects being reorganised and placed in a different context. So here we see the horn, one of the horns is up there on the right. So placed an, in a prominent position um, uh, as it was a significant object, but a very different fate for the drums. And hopefully you can see them here. I've um, blown them up here. These are the sacred drums, which are being used as tables. And they have flowers and photographs scattered on them. Not quite willy-nilly, but you can see that there is utter disdain for the fact that these were significant sacred objects for a pre-colonial society, or perhaps even heightening the fact of these are so important because they uh, they have to be in a way controlled by the British and placed and, and sort of uh, demeaned in this context because they are sacred, because they have power. So I've discussed in my work about, you know, how this tells us about British understandings of culture and what they are trying to do through these objects. Um, they then come on display again. Um, this is in a, 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 an exhibition, um, and this was uh, the minister who put these objects on display. You can see them here. So again, this time in a clutter of objects being displayed to the Swahili people. Then they're moved to a museum. Um, and then finally, in the kind of uh, interesting kind of conclusion to the story, um, they are actually brought out of the museum at the time of the Zanzibar revolution, when they overthrew um, the Omani um, rule who had taken over from the British at independence, um, and um, the kind of Swahili population um, took power. Um, and these projects were brought out again from the, from the museum and beaten in the streets. So we see there a recognition that they still had sacred power and that they could be reactivated. And fine, now they are in the museum curated and displayed by um, the people of Zanzibar choosing how to put them into context. So putting them right back into the context of their original leader. So that was an object biography that I really enjoyed exploring and thinking about. Very lucky to find these photographs. Sometimes I'd be studying pictures and suddenly I'd find the drums were there again. It's a really exciting way to think about it. But also we see how the objects were used in these different spaces. And there are other examples of these kinds of objects. Um, so some of you may be very familiar with the Akan drum created in West Africa. And again, this is a sort of form of biography one can take. In West Africa, they were a royal instrument. Drums were used as a means of communication. Um, it's then believed that they were transported on a ship carrying enslaved Africans. It's possible it would have been taken by the enslaved people themselves, or perhaps there are, um, it has been discussed that they may have been used as a, a form of forcing the enslaved to exercise on the ships. There are reports of that being done, of playing drumming music. Um, we don't know specifically with these drums, it could have been, um, it's speculated it could have been um, uh, smuggled on board by um, an enslaved person. Um, in the American colonies, the use of drums within enslaved communities became symbols of resistance. And we actually see um, uh, African drums being banned or being used um, because they were seen to kind of, uh, in a way, uh, and uh, give too much, uh, uh, sort of uh, be a symbol of, of, uh, indig uh, of African culture that they wanted to suppress. But what's interesting here is that the um, close study of these objects has shown that the, um, the, the top of it is made from the skin of Native American animals. So it's believed perhaps are the enslaved people trading with Native North Americans who might have then, they, from whom they would have purchased the skin to tie this object together with. So uh, there's many layers to that and bringing in, again, different peoples away from the traditional stories of the enslaved, which is dominated by the accounts of um, these, uh, this, the owners of plantations and so on. And um, this object, um, there's a, a really interesting reflection um, uh, by an African drummer on his thoughts about the meanings of this object on, uh, on a, a website, which I put up the link to here. And trying to put it into his West African context. Um, I, I mentioned this object earlier. I'm going to do a few objects and then talk about uh, um, teaching. Um, I um, hope that I'm not going to go on, but some, if somebody um, sort of highlights to me that um, I should stop talking, then please um, do. Um, uh, 
so yeah, just send me a message if I'm talking too long, please. Um, the but the loyalty um, to them. So this object I mentioned earlier, a beautiful sculpture of West uh, of Queen Victoria from West Africa, um, which actually shows many. These are always assumed to have been commissioned by Europeans, but recent work has completely overturned that. Um, but these are beautiful objects um, inspired um, by. Oops, sorry. Uh, um, inspired by these jubilee photographs of um, uh, the, of Queen Victoria, um, and which were circulated, and because it was a three quarter photograph, um, the artist was very keen to make sure she had shoes. So if you turn it up upside down, you can see that she has some feet in there as well. But you can see how closely the artist has um, uh, acknowledged all parts of her um, her her, um, her crown, her details, her jewelry. So this is a closely observed, very accomplished piece of work. Um, and also it conforms to West African tradition where the head is larger than the rest of the body. Um, there are many different examples of these um, uh, different types which um, Zachary Kingdon has gone through and analysed. And he, what he does, which I think really transforms our understanding of these objects, is rather than thinking of them simply as British officers commissioning images of the Queen from African artists, West African artists, is he's actually believes that these are commissioned by um, Aku people who were uh, the formerly people who lived in Sierra Leone having formerly been enslaved. They were liberated as it were into Sierra Leone in the 19th century. And then some of them then moved to Nigeria in the late 19th century. So it's a complex story of movement of people being enslaved from all over the region, then moving into um, uh, plantations and other situations, then moving back to Sierra Leone, then actually migrating again. So that, that, that's quite a complex element. But he identifies that these peop uh, the people, the Aku particularly, um, who were Yoruba speakers, were identified with um, and were uh, often had quite a loyalty to the monarchy and thought of themselves as part of the British modern world, partly due to their liberation. Um, and uh, they, um, and he believes that it is actually they who commissioned these objects and possibly women who did it. He has found evidence of particular female collectors listed in um, Liverpool museums um, and that they were in charge of domestic space. Um, so it may well be that story. So it's very exciting, the idea that actually objects that have been assumed to be considered within a colonial setting actually has a much more interesting story going on here. Um, and one which is complex, so that there isn't one single story of resistance. There were those who, um, people in Western Africa who wanted to show some loyalty as well. So again, it makes us think about the complexities of the colonial era. And of course, there are also objects which show resistance to empire. So Tipu's tiger here, um, which many of you may know in the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, uh, Tipu Sultan, who was a great foe of the British Empire, um, and uh, who was ultimately defeated and the object seized from his palace. This is one of the most spectacular um, and but was commissioned. Um, it's, uh, it contains an organ so it can be played. Um, so it's a European object as a French organ on the inside, but then on the outside, it's got this layer of this um, Indian artistry. Um, and it actually, its um, paw goes up and down and can growl as it hits the British soldier. So it's, it's a, and there's some fantastic narratives around that. The uh, uh, and one of the ways in which I use these um, objects, um, one thing I have done is, I mean, this is one where I've um, asked students to read an article about it, do a bit of research, and then I ask them to spontaneously say, "Okay, pick a pick one of these and tell me how you think this relates to the story of Tipu Sultan." So it might be about Tipu um, uh, uh, Tipu Sultan himself, as in the top um, central image. It might be about the idea of the tiger in, in colonial culture. Um, but we also, in those bottom images, talk a little bit about how it's been monetized. And, you know, that it's like a kind of Christmas decoration, this one on the left of Tipu's tiger and the um, and an app which goes alongside it where you can play the, um, you can play the organ and some of these, um, uh, these different ways it's interpreted. So we use the object as a starting point and then take this discussion in lots of different directions. Sorry, not sure. Oops. Sorry, the PowerPoint's going a bit strange again. Okay, so 
I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the kind of teaching side of this, because hopefully I've shared and enthused um, a lot about particular objects that I've used to great effect in the class, which have, I think, very rich stories which are documented, which you can draw on. Um, but in terms of asking questions of an object as an absolute starting point, um, you know, we can use this with any object. Um, you can introduce a thing and it can be a, something as simple as a watch or a phone or a um, um, anything or something you can bring in from home. But ask the students to think of all the questions they would ask of it. And this is something we've done, we, I used to do in the museum a lot. And what we can then do, which I think is quite powerful, is then that builds your worksheet or your inquiry. So you, in a way, you start from the questions they want to know, and then that's where you can let your inquiry go. Um, I mean, you can obviously frame it and push it in certain directions, um, but also you won't be able to answer them all. We don't have all that information. One of the uh, points about the Zachary Kingdon um, article, the Aku, um, uh, the um, yeah, sculpture of the of Queen Victoria, very little information was recorded with them. Um, colonial officers didn't write down the names of African artists because they didn't deem it interesting or necessary. So you've ha we have to recover this information elsewhere. But so when you create questions of an object, you can't answer them all. But even beginning to think about them will help focus your inquiry. What is it that we actually want to focus on here? And just to put this into a little bit of, um, uh, to visualize this a bit. Um, so this is um, our something if you start with an object these are just some of the questions that you might come up with the sort of bigger the big questions that you need to know when you're trying to understand an object who made it why was it made when how what was it made from what did it mean where was it made so these are all the kind of uh so sort of the nuts and bolts of understanding an object but then all of those have kind of lead you on to different questions. And I've put, I won't go through all of these, but each of these actually ask us to think about the meaning of the object in different ways. And it's thinking about these next questions that I think enables you to then focus an inquiry about what, are, what elements of it are you going to think about? Because there's so many possibilities with an object. So it might be that you're interested in how an object was placed in its original context and its meaning to an audience, how is it received? Or it might be very much about the production um, and the kind of how a thing was made. So you, it really is something where you've got to, you can kind of explode um, all the possibilities of an object. And sometimes I just use this as a kind of activity just to get us started to think about why things matter. So you don't necessarily have to use this as part of the formal inquiry, but it really helps you think about how can I build, a, you know, why are things important if anybody needs convincing. And so now I'm just going to reflect on some things I think about objects and inquiries. And this is where I'm taking this from the perspective, you know, slightly more from the university perspective where I currently work on. But hopefully some of it is, is will relate to, to work that you're doing. Um, sorry. Um, so I think it's, it's key that the right object can be the driving force of an inquiry. Um, the object as a witness, what has this object seen? If we're looking at a period in history, if you find the right object, or again, the biography of an object that has actually moved into different situations, what can that tell us about values um, and uh, different elements of that society we want to understand? Thinking about what knowledge to bring into the inquiry. So that's where I think going back to that previous question, that previous diagram, what elements will you be exploring? So you can't do everything. So what aspects of the object's history will you be thinking about? So I've just got a few starting points, which um, are some of the ways I think about it when I do when I write about material culture and, and when I teach with it. Oh, sorry. Um, Okay, the keys have start working and this is good. So again, starting with an object. And for that, you need like a really a, a object where you have lots of lots of evidence about it, um, a really rich story. But again, there's so much you can do with it. Um, and uh, if you were an, an example of this is if you're looking for um, African perspectives in colonial Nigeria, um, these palace doors are a fantastic resource in the British Museum, um, uh, which there are is online information about. It shows the arrival of a British officer um, into um, uh, meeting the Ogogo of Akeri, who was a, a, a leader uh, in Nigeria. 
and the, uh, the colonial officers are sitting there in a hammock um, and he arrives with his entourage. He's got convicts at the bottom helping him carry the taxes he's collecting. And on the left hand side, left hand door, you have the very regal image of the Agoga um, there uh, meeting the, um, uh, the colonial officer. And this is in a way uh, indirect rule in the, within wood and, and card from that perspective. It also has a lintel, which I put on the other side, uh, on the left hand side, which is um, a, a practice which uh, which sits above the doors, these palace doors, and uh, which has shows um, the eyes being eaten out of um, human um, faces with um, by birds. Um, this was a human sacrifice. Um, uh, uh, practice that was um, outlawed by the British, but we see it there kind of commemorated and embedded in in wood. Um, but speculating perhaps that that was the door under which the colonial officer would have had to walk. So there's a lot we can do with this in terms of understanding how colonial um, the colonial world worked on the ground. And so in a way that would be your, your kind of start, like really starting with the object itself. And then of course you could bring in other objects. These are some other uh, objects from a wonderful Yoruba artist called um, Thomas Ona. Um, and, luck, and with both of these objects, it's fantastic. We actually know the names of the artists of the previous one, Oluwe of Ise, um, a great African sculptor, um, Thomas Ona. Thomas Ona who um, himself devoted himself to looking at, um, to recording the colonial world. And so we see, again, working within the Yoruba tradition, but depicting what he saw of colonialism around him. On the left hand side, again, a British officer going around with his entourage. This, these are ways and perspectives. He says himself that these aren't satirical, they're not meant to be probing fun. They're, this is his interpretation of the world around him. I suppose the other, another way of thinking about this, you could start with a period of a, or a theme. So here I'm drawing on an example from history through material culture, and this is kind of outside of my, um, my field, um, but uh, the, um, we, we talk about this in the book, um, but the, the way in which you could talk about, for example, trying to understand early modern London and consumers. What did people in early modern London in this um, 17th century um, you, what did matter to them? What kinds of things were they using in their daily lives? Um, and again, you can go through, he goes through lots and lots of objects. So in, in a way, it's more about understanding that period rather than specific things. He does use a couple of examples of specific things. Um, uh, this teapot here, and then you see an image of somebody using a teapot. Um, but he's more interested in the kind of mass amount of material arriving. So for example, East India um, chintz and the way and then the numbers of people using that. So we can see how people are engaging in global things uh, by wearing and using these objects. So you know, you, you, if you use your period, you can actually use objects to drive an inquiry, but it doesn't have to be a single object. It can be thinking about bigger, bigger things, uh, many things if you want to. You could start with a person. So this is one that I sort of, uh, I like this just because there are so many things about this person. Uh, and I, I think Nelson's not necessarily on the curriculum anymore, but it's a good example of um, using an object to understand why a person mattered. Um, and the cult of Nelson was a huge thing. Objects, uh, you know, Nelson's hair was being, was kept preciously by people and displayed in exhibitions hundreds of years after his death even when the exhibition wasn't about Nelson. Um, and there are so many objects that tell us about how this particular man was commemorated and what he meant, that tells us a lot about British identity and um, the way in which particular successes and the, the world of the Navy was remembered in in the British, uh, within British culture. And again, these, these are histories that, yeah, again, we need to build, build them up and say, okay, this is actually about British identity here. So understanding that world. So it's not just about the things, but what they tell us about the society they inhabit. And this is a kind of starting with a concept, I suppose this one it might not be um, too relevant, but I was trying to think of like different ways in which we can explore this, but, you know, even concepts, we can use things. Um, this one, uh, the reception of classical ideas in the 19th century. This is important for me because of my studies, because of the way in which ideas about empire from and the classical empires informed ideas about how to manage the British empire. So a lot of that is based on text but it was also material as well. So um, this is an example of the pediment sculpture from the British Museum. When you walk up, that's the thing that sits above the entrance. But this couldn't be a better example of how the classical tradition is telling you about 
ideas of the 19th century. So in the middle, we have civilization um, there um, holding her spear and her globe. Um, well, this is the progress of civilization. She's accompanied by the, the arts. Um, and this justified um, Britain's in role in the imperial role and the civilizing mission. This is about bringing civilization to people. So, I mean, I think that I've talked a lot about these things and I know that some of the challenges that people face is where do you start with finding this material? So this is, you know, these are things that um, academics write articles about, but where do you start if you're wanting to incorporate these in? Um, but I think, you know, the, I love this idea, which is something Harriet said to me about the curriculum as a museum. Um, and there are so many possibilities, uh, but museum websites and projects are much better than they were uh, when I started working in museums, um, when museum databases were very limited in what they said. Now there are lots of pages with very rich um, um, information about objects. Um, and I've, I've, in the bibliography, I've, I've got a link to quite a few, which I think are really useful. Um, they have object databases, but again, project pages and essays, um, which can tell you some of these object biographies and give you that most recent research. Um, some of you will remember the history of the world and 100 objects by the British Museum. Um, that is still a very useful database, I think. Um, I think there is a new project, which I put the link to here, 100 histories of 100 worlds in one object, which is trying to flip that project a little bit on its head and bring in a more diverse, uh, diverse range of voices and try and move it a little bit away from the very British Museum um, centre of the world kind of perspective. So it's really useful now to read those different things alongside each other because we learn an awful lot more. Um, a project I was actually involved in at the BM, so, um, so um, a full disclaimer there, teaching history in 100 objects where we tried to, um, uh, we wanted to show how the, the curriculum could be global at a time when there was a real threat that it was really narrowed down to a very British story. And we wanted to say, actually, you can teach all of this stuff through things and they can be global. Um, and uh, that covers a wide range, even if the ideas and the curriculum ideas there aren't necessarily what you want. There's some really good research in there and some great objects as starting points. There are also a lot of journals and um, open access materials out there. Um, the Winter Tour Portfolio is one, um, and there are other kinds of, which is devoted to the study of material culture, particularly in the US, but um, uh, it is actually becoming again more global. The most recent um, art, uh, um, uh, 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 issue um, was about histories of enslavement. So there's some really interesting material in those kinds of things. But again, it might be that museum web pages actually tell you them as much as you can, uh, what you need. And I suppose one thing which I have found the most beneficial, and this is where I'm going to conclude, um, um, is, um, is getting students to research object histories. Now, this depends, of course, which age you're looking at, but actually student research, I think, is something they can do at different ages um, if you direct them to the right websites. Um, if you tell them to go to the right websites, there are really rich possibilities for bringing in objects. So in my Objects of Empire course, um, we start with an object and students bring in, you know, whether that's a printout or they email me, um, an object to discuss, which they found on a museum database. So we then have a collection of objects to discuss. Um, and this then both enriches there, it gives them a real possibility for showing how they've researched and then thought about why these things are relevant and really contributing. So it doesn't have to be complicated. What can you find out about this thing? What is your object evidence of? So why is it relevant? What is it showing us? And how does it link to our theme? So again, I, you know, I do this with um, uh, slavery, I do it with spoils of war, I do it with Pacific, uh, the Pacific um, agency, um, you know, but it can be any theme, but actually put, getting students to do research now, um, uh, you know, and I, uh, you know, again, you, you will know your students best, but it's, it's a really rich way that they can feel like they're really being historians, um, because object, the object information is just there. It's much easier to find objects as primary sources than it is to say, go and find some primary source text online, which, you know, from, it is, can be quite challenging as my students find all the time. So um, I'm, Going to finish there. Um, I realize I've talked for quite a long time. This is the um, kind of um, uh, bibliography that I'll um, make sure is shared with everyone um, in case you want to follow up any of these specific things and the recommended databases. I realize this is quite to my interest in imperial history, um, but you will find some really amazing resources there. The Royal Collection has got really extraordinary stories and you see quite how many things were passed to uh, Queen Victoria from across the world is it's astonishing. Um, and some Americans ones there, which are, you know, so now that museums are really improving their databases, there is lots of this material there for you to use.
So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that some of that was useful to you um, and I look forward to hearing your questions, um, uh, uh, speaking to some of them now. But if there aren't things we can't cover now, please feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be delighted to hear from you and the kinds of things you're working on. Right, starting with um, Caitlin. So have you got any recommendations as to where we can look for objects to introduce to our lessons? I think you have covered that. Um, oh, this is a good one. Right, what is the one object you think every student should engage with whilst they're at school? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And I wish I'd prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think what I might say is an object which, well, it's a set of objects which I keep coming back to, and I didn't actually put in this deliberately because I thought, well, not deliberately, I thought, I, you probably most of you know these anyway, but I think the, the Benin plaques, I think, are so just astonishing. They are such extraordinary records of West African history themselves, regardless of their colonial story and the kind of, which is of course very important, but actually in their original state, what they tell us about late 15th and early 16th century Benin in terms of their, uh, the quality of the craftsmanship, the culture, the way that we can see the culture depicted through things, through objects, um, and you know, the, st the stories that are told, the belief systems that we see through the incorporation of the mudfish and the and the leopards and you know there's so many different symbols that go on there um of course they then have this other story you know, this next level of their story which is really important to understand and has scarred and shaped those objects as to how and where they are but they were the objects which every time i was in the british museum i just and stood in front of them it, they were awe-inspiring in terms of how extraordinary they are um so i've that's i've, I've kind of tweaked your question there because i've just referred to about you know 500 objects in one <laughs> answer but um i think you know you could pick any one of the benin plaques and tell an extraordinary story through it um, and i think that everyone should encounter that um not just as a like this is the story of colonial brutality but also this is the, this is an African kingdom at the same time as the Tudors. If you want to apply your ideas of kingship, you can do it all through looking at these things. Um, you can read those stories so clearly. So those are the ones that I would, you know, everyone should know about and I can talk about endlessly and we'll try and stop. And we had a really good conversation ages ago, didn't we, about um, the Benin plaques as well, didn't we? Yeah. No. Right. OK. Um, this is from my colleague, um, Gary McDonough, um, who my focus is modern 20th century. So how do you treat mass produced objects that may not be seen important at the time, but help us teach history of the time? I th mass produced objects are really interesting. And I think this is where there's there's kind of different approaches to them. Um, and I think that uh, the person who, uh, the scholar who I would, highlight just um the, whose work i think is so brilliant on this is deborah sug ryan she's called deborah s-u-g-g -G hyphen r-y-a-n um she's a design historian by trade but she tells incredible stories and she's got a new project about um kenwood looking in the kenwood archive and about um food processors and um those kinds of things and their meaning and what they tell us um for me the kind of mass-produced things a re, like a great starting point for thinking about gender and about the way that women were released from different areas of work during the, the, the 20th century because of the availability and the production of things. Um, and uh, the, the v &A would be a great place to start in terms of thinking about what those things could be if you wanted to select a few, like because of the idea of the design of these things. Okay, yes, they have quite often have the kind of notable examples, um, but there are, they do also collect the kind of the everyday as well. Um, so my mind for the 20th century would be um, uh, would be thinking about how those things transform society and particularly that idea of releasing women from domestic tasks, which then enables them to can, uh, interact and, and uh, move into society in a different way, I think are, are really interesting. But I think Deborah Sagarine, she was a consultant on the, um, I think it's the Histories of the Home TV programme. Um, she's great on Twitter. And um, so she and talks about the, also about the kind of objects in domestic space and what they mean. Um, I will stop there because I can, again, I, I know that there will be other questions, um, but again, feel free to get in touch if you want to talk more about that um, that particular question. Sorry, Sarah, so just to interject very quickly, I'm just type 
furiously putting up putting out a tweet on Twitter. Is it sub Ryan S U G S U G G hyphen Archie she is on Twitter, but I don't know what her handle is off the top of my head. Thank you. Okay, thanks very ever so much for that. Right. Um, so next question then is this might you might be able to give a really good answer to this um, with your background in museums. So Gemma says that she sometimes finds um, local museums a little bit reluctant to work with schools. Um, what are your sort of top tips to get museums to engage with local local schools and local departments? Well, I mean, it's as somebody who, when I was an education officer, you know, that was my job was to try and <laughs> to try to to do this. So it's um, a kind of I've worked I've, I've I've been fortunate enough to work from perspective where that was that was my my job. Not all museums have that resource, um, so you know it's it's not something that they are actually able to do. I think that from um, getting to speak to the right person is, is key um, and finding out who that is. And sometimes it can be a case of just asking the front desk people, actually starting at that level and saying, you know, who, we, you know we're keen to engage with people, who, who is there an education person? Because if there isn't a formal education system set up, then sometimes you might need to go through a different route. Sometimes if they don't have a formal person in that role, you, know, you might discover through conversations in the museum that actually this person's really enthusiastic. Um, it's, I mean, you know, in smaller museums, um, we have to recognize how limited their funds are, and particularly in the last few years, they've had a lot of funding cuts. Um, and uh, so we have to we have to be sympathetic to what they're trying to do and, and the pressures that how many roles many in, in smaller museums are having to take on. Um, I think trying to demonstrate that engage, you're engaging with a collection, um, uh, the, 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 why you want to engage with the collection, the things you're interested in exploring, trying to kind of explain your interest as best you can. Um, it's, uh, I, you know, and I, uh, most museums now really want to encourage it. Um, it's just about finding a way that makes it feel manageable for them, understanding the pressures that they may also be um, under in order to welcome the number of visitors that they might like to. I'm sorry, it's not a very satisfactory answer, but it's no. quite a hard, it's a hard question to... It to is hard, it's a hard question, yeah, definitely. Um, right, we've got a couple That's more. what I would probably do if I was in that situation. Um, yeah, thank you for that, that was really, really helpful. Um, we've got a couple more questions and lots of thanks coming in, and both from Twitter and also on the chat as well. So our next question is from Simon Beale, is how important is it to have actually have access to the object that you're teaching about? That, that's a great question. And I think what I've been saying here, you know, you, uh, what I've been saying here is that you don't actually have to. So much can be done without the physical thing and that quite often you can um, conjure the experience um, through without things. And, you know, and this is we were I was trying to teach material culture history online where, you know, everybody was in separate rooms. We weren't even able to, like, interact as we did our curating. So um, I think the objects most ha often have a power that allows you to work with a reproduction, whether that's a, a, a printout or a, on a screen. If you're doing that, I do think it's really useful to be clear about some things like scale, um, like how big is this? Because it really matters um, that, uh, you know, for example, Tipu's tiger is kind of this big. It's well, you can't even see my hands, it's huge. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not an intricate little um, robot that this, that it's, it's huge. Um, but the Yarba Queen Victoria is this big, the Benin plaques are this kind of size, that kind of thing I think can help to materialize it. Thinking about the material qualities of the thing can help you do that. Nothing can be being in front of the object, but we can't all go to museums as regularly as we would like that. And particularly at secondary level, you know, there is so much pressure on the curriculum. It's so difficult to get kids out of class um, to do a museum visit that we have to be we have to find these other ways to um, uh, to, do, to teach. So. Um, Bringing in your own things again can bring it can it, it doesn't necessarily have to be related, as I said, with that kind of introductory task, you know, can you bring in an object practice asking questions of it. Um, what I do that's something we used to do at the BM, you, we would take an artifact, but it could just be something you picked up on a holiday or like it, it can just be something a little bit unusual. Um, and we would pass it around and everybody has to say who they were in the life of the object. And it starts off with, I was the person who made it. And then the next person said, okay, I was the person who painted it. Next person said, 
I was the person who dropped it because it's cracked. Um, and then but people get more and more creative with it. So again, it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what the object is, but it's getting this idea of objects have a life, objects have a biography, people interact with things and they mean different things to different people. And that's just one activity we used to do. Actually, we did that quite a lot with teacher training. It was really good fun. Um, but again, you can use physical things to kind of prompt the inquiry if you don't have the actual stuff that pertains to your particular topic. Um, and we, we also do, you know, I, I don't want it to, I, I don't think it should be a barrier that you can't have the things, you know, use, the, the, use the best examples you can, even if it's going to be um, on, on a screen or on a page. I think there's some like um, really good, obviously, if you look at the web the websites for lots of museums, some are like the, you know, the British Museum has a great sort of like photographic collection of lots of objects as well. So those things could, you know, quite easily be, you know, shown, shown in a lesson. And, and, that's, and Sketchfab, quite a few of them can do, is it Sketchfab? There's a three dimensional one. So a lot of BM objects have been 3D scanned. And so you can yeah. them in the round and look at them and like look at them in, in, in you know, go under them and look at in them in detail. Yeah, just a bit of a, of a shameless plug as well. Um, the I did myself and my colleagues at school, but also through Be Bold, we've, we've done a load of work with the Wallace collection over the last year. And we've, this will be coming out soon, so hot off the press, but we've just finished at my school teaching a, a, an inquiry, uh, how, what to the, uh, the Wallace collections, a, sh a shanty gold reveal about the British empire. Um, and they've just, the Wallace collection, have just published a load of high res images of their Ashanti goals that teachers can go and use um, and things as well. So it's a little known, known museum that has an, a remarkable collection. Um, oh, so, incredible yeah. stuff. And, and the fact they have Asante gold in there is, is remarkable. Um, they, um, so again, all the um, uh, websites that I've mentioned on this page all have really good quality, like definitely projector quality images um, of lots of their objects. That's, that's uh, kind of one of the reasons I use them a lot. One, I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> right, final question then. So this is from Sasha. So she's teaching in Lincoln. What do you think will be the most valuable object for examining our local history? Oh, quite oh. a niche question. <laughs> okay, well, uh, so this again, I'm going to slightly dodge the question because, um, well, I mean, there's multiple things in the cathedral you could use. Um, and, you know, whether you want to look at Victorian stained glass or you want to look at um, various parts of that, which are just extraordinary, the Roman stuff in the collection. The object, again, which is turning it to my interest, which I use with my students, and we walk up to the Usher Gallery, which is the art gallery in Lincoln to see, is the portrait of Joseph Banks, who was a um, Lincolnshire man. Um, but he was also the person who was on Captain Cook's voyage and went to the Pacific with him and came back with a huge collection of stuff. And the portrait we have in the Asher Gallery is of Joseph Banks wearing a Maori cloak surrounded by regalia from different Pacific communities. Um, and it's a stunning thing. Um, and this is, I mean, it's, it's, and it's a great reason to get the students out of the classroom into a gallery. Um, it's enormous. So it tells us so much of the status of the person and how he's using physical objects to just transform himself into an explorer, somebody who knows about the world. So it's a very conventional late 18th century portrait in some ways, but also has this like extraordinary global thing going on. Um, I, and, and then what we do with my students is we then go and find the original object, so examples of a Maori cloak, and we try and say, well, what did that mean to the Maori? Okay, let's put these back in context, let's replace these objects back to where they really came from. Now, I've taken us quite far away from Lincolnshire there, um, but I think one of the reasons I'd say that is that also, lo you know, local collections have big, um, uh, uh, big stories that can connect us with the world as well. Um, and I, I would have to defer to one of my colleagues who actually works on Lincoln's history um, to, um, uh, to get to get you, but feel free to get in touch because I do know people who could tell you some fantastic examples of things that are, are uh, from different periods. But again, like I said, it also we also have those global stories to tell as well from this region and there's sorry just to come in again i think there's a point there about um using your local history to also start your history curriculum sally sally burnham um did a really good talk uh at, has done loads of really good talks but uh did a very good talk at the ha conference i think she did it at shp as well last year um about how she's used objects to start her curriculum by asking how can we learn? I think she's up Lincoln Way, but how can we learn about her, um, the town in which her school is situated? How can we learn about its story? Um, we took that in my school, completely ripped it off, 
and stole it. Um, so our, my school's in the, the local London borough of Hounslow. So we said, well, what can we learn about Hounslow's story through objects? Um, and actually we got in touch with local history groups, um, all sorts. They were able to give us loads of objects to use. I've been teaching in Hounslow for eight years and I knew nothing about it. And it's amazing. We've got Mesolithic objects. We've got Neolithic objects, Iron Age, Roman, early modern, you name it. Viking swords, all sorts of things. So I think talk to local history groups because they are a wealth of knowledge and, and we could start with objects and the objects from your local area in year seven. And, and also, you know, people, people talk to their grandparents, you know, their grandparents might have amazing things and it brings that personal element right in. Um, and they, you know, they, their families know because quite often teachers move around between different places. We, we don't know the story of where we work, whereas, you know, the students and their families are actually of that place. And so that can be a great way to bring in that personal element. And, um, and again, the idea of object stories and why things survive and why they're here. Okay, then I think that's all the questions um, that we currently have. Um, so unless there's any bonus ones from you, Sam? Um, no, not from me. I think we would probably be better let you go, Sarah. <laughs> um, but, but I think all that's left for me to say is, is one final thank you from, from Harriet and I and everyone on the, the Be Bold History team, but also from everybody on here on here tonight. That, that really was a tour de force and that was phenomenal and gave me so much to think about, as I'm sure it has everyone else too. Um, one final, final thanks as well to everybody who's joined the call tonight. And um, I think uh, Harriet and I, for us, it's a real thrill to have so many people on the call on a wet and cold January evening, and it is flipping cold. Um, so history teachers never cease to amaze me. We're a phenomenal bunch. And yes, we're super geeky, but it's great. Um, and it's so wonderful to see so many people here and, and engaging with the network. So a massive, massive thank you. Um, please do kind of keep an eye on what we're doing. There's going to be, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, a couple of announcements coming out over the next week or two. And um, we're also, I know there's a massive backlog of videos which haven't gone up on YouTube yet. Um, I'm actually talking to a video editor tomorrow. Um, to help us to, to deal with the backlog, basically. Um, and hopefully loads of stuff will be going up on YouTube in due course. We've got stuff from Ben Walsh going up, um, Ben Newmark, um, and stuff going back to sort of October um, as well that we haven't managed to get up yet. But we are history teachers too, and we're also really busy. Um, but no, hopefully that will be up soon. So keep an eye out. Um, I guess the only other thing to say, Sarah, um, this PowerPoint is brilliant. Would you mind sharing it with us and then we can share it widely with people? I'll put it under like, I'll, I'll put a link to a, a Google Doc underneath the, what goes up on YouTube eventually. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, no, no. It was intended to be shared. So everything, hopefully the hyperlinks will link you out to useful documents and things as well. Um, and yeah, and thank you so much for your interest. It's, it's a fantastic network. Just keep in touch. Let me know how I can support you in the future. Um, it's, it's a wonderful way to speak to school teachers and, um, uh, you know, you do fantastic work. And so thank you for the, it's been a real privilege to talk to you tonight. Oh, no. Thank you. It's been wonderful.